to Reese, just to formally introduce um, Cheryl to you. Thanks again, Eric. Uh, yeah, so as everyone's probably read already in the little blurb when we first uh, promoted the uh, forum, Cheryl is a proud descendant of the Arante people of central um, Queensland um, and has worked in the Aboriginal primary health for over 20 years. She's been a CDE for about six years and is currently working at the Mamalala Health Services um, at, at the West Arnhem region of the top end in Northern Territory. Uh, Cheryl has a lot of knowledge and is willing to share it with us today and share her story with us today. Uh, so thank you, Cheryl, for coming on and I'll uh, move it over to you. Okay, thank you. I'll just um, do the share screening and I apologise if the room is a bit echoey. Um, I'm in my office in Darwin, so I'm usually out and about. So everyone can see that one and hear me okay? Yes, beautiful, Cheryl. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much for the invitation, Eric and um, Reese. Um, I'll just see if I can keep how I progress through my um, slideshow. Enter. All right. So I'd just uh, like to acknowledge the Larrakia people as the traditional owners of the Darwin region, and I pay respects to the Larrakia elders past and present. I'm a visitor here. My traditional country and ancestors are from Central Australia, the Central Australian uh, Aboriginal peoples. Um, it's a place of my mum's birth and my grandmother's birth. Um, as we can see, I do like this link um, for everyone to consider and think about um, whose country am I on? Um, it's not very clear on here, um, but I'm sure lots of people have seen this map. And interesting enough too is um, culturally also looking at sites of conception is important too, and sites of uh, birth, and then also wherever you're travelling to, because I am doing a lot of travelling, just understanding that you're going to someone else's country, and you, sometimes you need to put it out there too, so I'm, I'm a visitor here and um, just bring some protection around yourself. So primary care, um, health care is what I've always been about and cultural safety. So effective primary health care can help avoid unnecessary hospitalizations, improve health outcomes. So health, you know, prevention is what I really want to try and focus on. And cultural safety is a really important one. It's when I started my nursing degree was something that really came to the forefront. And it's defined by the consumer um, accessing care and they must be involved in the decision making about how their care is delivered. And cultural safety at an individual level addresses, level addresses the power imbalance between health practitioners and the consumer. And that's definitely there still. Um, Cultural safe practice involves practitioners acknowledging their own beliefs and biases and can influence their practice and the way that consumers receive care. So I'm trying to always address that issue, usually everywhere I go, I'm sure everyone else is too. I really like this quote from Lila Watson too, if you've come here to help me, you are wasting your time, but if you come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Language matters is a really good one too. Um, just words, of course, they're the most powerful drug used by mankind really. So um, I, I like that quote. Um, I get a lot of um, victim blaming. Um, 
a lot of non-compliance, I really hate that word, <laughs> and non-adherence. But you just have to be strong and deal with um, how you are trying to immerse yourself in uh, the environment that you're in. I really do like this intergenerational trauma video also. Um, so I've left a link in that, and I'm sure lots of people have seen that already too. So know what you're dealing with. And um, Uncle Jack too, this is an absolutely beautiful meditation that um, anyone can listen to. It, it just really is grounding for a lot of people just to stop and go, I need some time for me in um, sometimes a very turbulent um, place in some of the Aboriginal communities um, and, yeah, just in general, especially with COVID, that's just gone past. Well, still around. Okay, so my pathway to becoming a credential diabetes educator. So it is a bit wishy-washy this um <laughs> this presentation because I just got back from Manangrita last night and um yeah it's yeah it's been really hard to find some time, but I've done the best that I can. So yeah, I finished in my degree, um, my nursing degree in Adelaide, Indus University. Um, I started my degree when both of I've got two daughters and both of them had just gone into primary school and I said, all right, I need some time to do this. Um, and then I started work working at Alice Springs Hospital. I was there uh, for eight months. And that was my first job after having doing my graduate nurse program in Adelaide at the Repat Hospital. Um, yeah, it wasn't long before I progressed over to Central Australian Aboriginal Congress, which is the, the major AMS there, and um, sort of ran away after a couple of years and worked on a film called Samson and Delilah, <laughs> which I can talk about later. Um, and then I was run up by the CEO, Donna Archie, who offered me a nursing position to complete diabetes cycles of care which really threw me into the whole diabetes arena. I'd already been exposed to diabetes, but this was really hitting it. Um, and I was in there doing all sorts of stuff like, there wasn't a podiatrist, so I was cutting nails and I was doing eye checks and retinal screens and all sorts. Uh, so yeah, I got really interested in diabetes and uh, completed my diabetes education and postgraduate certificate at Flinders University after um, a Dr. Alex Brown from, um, he's over at Samory in South Australia at the moment, but he um, provided me with um, a grant to do that, which was so appreciated. Um, a position at Healthy Living NT was the diabetes position that I was in for a while. And then I, um, I think I ran away again and came back. <laughs> and uh, I credentialed at, I was offered a position as a, um, a diabetes educator position and I credentialed. So I went through my six month pathway there, which was fantastic. Um, so who am I? Central Australia in Alice Springs is my um, homeland, um, Central um, Arunda Peoples. Um, my mother was institutionalised at the St Mary's Children's Home in Alice Springs. So she always told me lots of stories as I grew up in Adelaide um, about um, Alice Springs. So I just progressed back there. So I worked at Central Australia for over 20 years. So I gained lots of experience there. Just going back, before I started uni, I was um, a bit of a run -up. So I had to go and put myself in the army to army reserves to sort me out a bit. So I thought I'd put that picture in there. So this is, you know, my short little time that I had in there, the, uh, four years. Um, it really grounded me and really sorted me out because you had to get, you know, you had to get organised and you had to make sure that if you were on time, you were late. And if you um, were five minutes early, then you were on time. So it really sorted my life out because it got a little bit chaotic um, there for a while, which I won't go too much into. Uh, so, yeah, I started my um, nursing, my first year of nursing, and I, um, as a mature age student, I hit it straight away. My first assignment was addressing Aboriginal health inequalities and it really made me study hard and really dig into the resource and, and what the, the issues are out there. I did highlight some of the things that um, I thought 
um, were important, like um, employing more Aboriginal people is one of my main things that I, I thought about too. And then also um, the nursing um, curriculum, which is, you know, across the board, it's still um, a lot to, um, there's still a lot of movement that needs to happen there, but it, it's a lot more than when I started because I, I wanted to do a placement in um, Tennant Creek and they said, well, that's just not part of our our program, so it's not going to happen. So um, now there's nursing students that are doing graduate nurse programs in ANSs. So that was um, part of some of the things I have seen progressed and I'm still still working on it, but... <laughs> And I was so much younger then. <laughs> um, so I also, again, talked um, uh, about cultural safety and transcultural nursing. Um, and the differences between those two were um, transcultural nursing sort of said, well, you can learn a little bit about um, an Aboriginal culture and, and you'll be fine. Um, which obviously isn't true. And then cultural safety really, really opened my eyes as I spoke um, before about that you have to look at your own practice and understand that other people are coming from, uh, they have different worldviews. And... Um, okay, so... I'm going to turn volume on so I can hear Anna. <laughs> All right, so I work for Malala Health Service, um, Aboriginal, Aboriginal Corporation. Oh, can, are we able to? Um, oh, how do I go back? Okay. You might be able to press the back arrow. That might take you back. Like on the. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So Maningarita is where I work, but I'm very lucky. So I'm in um, Darwin. So I moved up from Alice Springs um, and I did do a couple of other things. And then I landed this position, very um, fortunate to be able to stay in um, in Darwin um, and fly out to, or drive out to five different places. But it's Malala that I'm employed by and they've got grant funding for me to pro provide services to other places. So it's a remote um, Indigenous community in Arnhem Land and it's approximately 520 kilometres east of Darwin. Um, and you can read some of the things on there about um, what the place means. So it's the place is where the dreaming changed shape and I'm still, you know, talking with uh, local people up there about gaining more cultural understanding um, of the, the place, very different from Central Australia, obviously. Um, but uh, a lot of people are very interested in that. I've come from Central Australia and some people have travelled there and it's just really um, nice to do that in a consult when you are with people to acknowledge where you're from so they can acknowledge where they're from too. Um, so Manning Brita has a population of about 2,600 people. So it's the biggest community that I do go through. And not only that, there's just that many surrounding homeland, our stations. Um, yeah, so it's big. So there's Darwin. And uh, this is where I go to. And I do fly to the top there. It's Ninja Lane, which is um, also known as Croker Island. And some people will know the history of Cracker Island and um, the removal of children there, uh, taken to there. Uh, so I do find Alice Springs people still there. <laughs> um, same with Warrawee, that's Golden Island, the next place. Um, and then Manigrito is the furthest away and then Gumbalanya and Jabiru are in the Kapu, um region. So again, this is from the West um, Arnhem uh, Corporation, uh, there's the different areas, so the Kakadu area, well, actually, Gumbalanya isn't in the Kakadu area thing. So Jabiru is where I drive to. It's about two and a half um, hour drive, and it's sealed. It's fine. If I do drive onto Gumbalanya in the dry season, which it is at the moment, um, that's probably another hour and a half drive. And then I do, at the top there, I fly to Ninjaland, so Croker Island, or I fly to Warrawee, and those three dots, so Manningrida down the bottom. Very busy. So that's my life. 
um, at the moment is um, catching planes, um, dodging weather and storms and, um, yeah, I get to see the most beautiful things. I'm very lucky. So there's Manic Greta. Um, so I did already talk about um, Manic Greta. Um, and I just thought I'd put some pictures in here because I ran out of time. <laughs> but there's Gumbalanya, also known as Owen Pelly. So I do fly there normally, but I've been driving there because of the dry season. Very pretty, nice drive in Kakadu, known as the Stone Country, and the Stone Festival is on this weekend. Um, and then there's Mingeland, Croker Island, uh, population of about 331. And it's just located up there, the little island of the, the larger area there. And then Warrawins, Golden Island, population of about 500. Oh, my God, there's a spelling mistake. Don't look, anyone. Um, and so this young lady here, it was interesting that her uh, mother-in-law um, was in the home with my mum. So it was just, you can go to absolutely anywhere, and it's amazing, um, the networking in the Aboriginal community. Jabiru is an interesting place too. There's the crocodile um, uh, accommodation down the bottom there. But it's up in the, it's close to Stone Country too. The old um, clinic that um, I attend there is uh, actually an, uh, like an old hospital uh, for the mining uh, company. So um, they're building a new one and they're under the Red Lily organisation um, now. So there, a few of these places are transitioning from anti government over to um, private, what, what Man and Greta did. So, yeah, there's a the Kakadu National Park and there's a Jabiru um, bird. So I've got to put a Jabiru bird in there and put Jabiru's named after. And that's the Kakadu. And so um, there's the Kales Crossing on the right-hand side. It's a, a very, very well-known crossing to get over to Gumbalanya and you can only drive, drive over in the wet season. And then just people, you can see right down the bottom left-hand side of the where the... Um, the crossing is and there's just a man sitting there and they all fish there and there's crocodiles in the water <laughs> so it's just absolutely crazy scary to drive over to so there's a nice large crocodile and why are people fishing there they're after the ever elusive um barramundi Okay, so I'm going back in time now. So um, just before Christmas, I went to Boab Health Services and um, provided an Aboriginal um, service to the Aboriginal uh, Medical Service um, there called Brahms and also Dull, so Broome Regional Aboriginal Medical Service and um, then um, Darby do. I can't remember how they pronounce it, but they're pretty particular about it. Um, and then there was a small community outside of there called Luma, which is another hour and a half drive to, and there was an, a couple of Alice Springs nurses there. It was just, yeah, it's bizarre. <laughs> and then when I went to Derby, there was, an, um, there was a couple of Aboriginal families there from Murujuli, <laughs> which is um, just out of the rocks. Like, yeah, just go anywhere. So there's me pictured with the um, podiatrist, and there's a, a lovely boab tree, and, um, yeah, it was um, very busy there too, and um, but I got to just meet different people, which was great, and the weather's similar to up here. Okay, so going back in time again, I just went, well, I'm going to go and work on a film set for a while. So on the film set, they had a scenario there where someone had um, type 1 diabetes. So that was interesting. So um, we had to go through how you would... Um, process that uh, or how you would portray that person on film what sort of symptoms they would have and that sort of thing should have been a bit of a red flag um, when I started this um, film because it was motocross <laughs> and what do you think happened on day one yep off you came broke just about everything and yeah it was um, interesting but if I go back in time for a while too I was also on those sets and then Delilah film set which was um, an amazing film and um, all filmed around um, Alice Springs um, and some of the out, out areas, but just, yeah, just a great 
great film if anyone hasn't seen it. Okay, so going back in time then, I spent a year at Danila Dilba, which is the Aboriginal Medical Service in Darwin. Um, I pitched there with a dietitian and podiatrist. Um, yeah, Darwin is a beautiful place. I moved up from Alice Springs because Alice Springs just got too cold. <laughs> After 20 years of winters, I just needed a bit of a, a, bit of a um, sea change. Uh, so, yeah, that was a very, very busy place too. Saw lots of Alice Springs people up here in Darwin. Uh, five satellite clinics um, so yeah there wasn't any remote work um, there but yeah it was it was really good and then I went a bit rogue and worked for NTPHN and um, just as an independent practitioner but I did link in a lot with the podiatrists so I went to Kintor, um, Utopia, um, so known as Europunja um, uh, Hermesburg, west of Alice Springs. So all of these places helped me progress further as um, a diabetes educator. Congress is where I cut my teeth. So um, Central Australian Congress is a large Aboriginal medical service um, that I started off as a primary health care nurse when I moved over from Alice Springs Hospital when I was in the emergency department. So, yeah, I just moved over to Congress and that's where I essentially stayed. Did run away a couple of times, um, but, yeah, that was home to me um, and worked in the satellite clinics and also in four different remote sites. So that was... Um, so there's Alice Springs, there's a um, lovely picture of Mount Gillen in Alice Springs and a picture of mum getting some uh, bush tucker and there was also the little ninty beads for that they make necklaces with. So I went to a place called um, Arionga, which is by um, a service provided, um, well, it's a service of Congress. And, um, yeah, a nice picture of a donkey. And I also stayed there for seven weeks during COVID just to um, support the small clinic. It's quite small. And then Murujulu was a nice place to go to. You'd wake up every morning and um, have that uh, beautiful view and ride a bike around the outside. Uh, there is the Murujulu is just very, very close to the, to the rock. Um, Yalara is about 30 minutes out if anyone's been there. Um, we had a, quite a nice dusty um, trip there. So I got um, a picture there. I used to go in a little podiatry truck with the podiatrist, which was um, a really great service because we would get the truck and just take it to anywhere, um, maybe one of the council meetings or the art centre and ask people to come in to the truck and um, get double service. So working together and co collaborating is just really important. So that's outside of our um, housing that would be at, and yeah, the rock's just right there, and there's the truck, which broke down numerous times, which was, yeah, not handy, but <laughs> all part of um, travelling remote. Uh-oh. Oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> So, yeah, there's a bit of a dust storm. And, you know, it's a bit of an um, indication of the diabetes that's um, heading, um, especially in the Aboriginal community and the ages that I'm seeing. So five years old is the youngest and the intergenerational um, diabetes is becoming a re really big problem, or it already is. So I'm trying to work a lot harder. So when you're a diabetes educator, um, you really do need to um, go in, in the direction or learn so much more. And I, the, one of the biggest learning curves I've had is learning uh, for diabetes and pregnancy and trying to just get, get to that stage where you're, you're really looking at health promotion and prevention uh, of diabetes. Thought I'd just go into a couple of interesting things. Uh, like I said, I just put this um, presentation together, so I just threw a couple of other interesting things together, traditional sweet foods, 
And just to know about, um, because you are talking to people a lot about um, food and nutrition. So there's a picture of me trying to dig four, if anyone can guess. And, um, yeah, I've got some nasty blisters there, but these ladies will dig, like, they've got such strong arms. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the honey ants, or in central Australia, known as yamba. So, yeah, I mean, if you're getting this type of sweet food, you've got to work for it. It's pretty hard. So, you know, exercise, and they're not that big. <laughs> but, yeah, just delicious. And there's a couple of other bush foods that I just put on there too that my mum used to talk about as I was growing up, um, the bush coconut, or she still does, and the, um, the scale that's on um, the gum tree that's quite sweet and very nutritious too. And there's, there's a few other ones. Um, and I just wanted to really just touch very quickly on the, the story of Australian sugar, and it's just the bane of my life is the sugar the amount of sugar that's in food and all that sort of stuff. But it's interesting to know that sugar cane was brought on board the first fleet in 1788 and it was in 1866 that the first commercial cane plantation was um, set up near Brisbane. And it was um, from cheap and plentiful local labour force. But then there was um, predominantly South Sea Islander people um, that were brought over for this sugar industry. And um, just a warning for the next picture, it's um, showing some of these people that were stolen and brought in over. So they were deported on the sole racial to target a mass deportation of Australian history and enacted by one of the cruelest pieces of legislation that we've ever had. So a lot of people were, and there's still lots of people that, um, that are up in Queensland area that uh, are lost to their family. And just finishing up on um, just some of the statistics. So I think we all know that um, diabetes is quite rife um, in the Aboriginal community. And like I said, on the left-hand side there, you can see gestational diabetes is just going up um, at a crazy rate and it does have an impact on the baby and it's a lot of work. And it is actually very hard work for these mums um, once they are diagnosed with gestational diabetes or they have di uh, pre-existing diabetes. Or, um, and it's a lot of work for myself and midwives to chase them up, get insulin started if needed, get sugar, um, managing, checking sugars, very sore fingers up to four to six times a day, um, starting medication if needed and just really wrap these ladies up in cotton wool so we have the most beautiful baby born um, in the most healthiest way possible and have mum uh, healthy too. Um, just uh, also thought I'd throw in there that I've got um, five grandchildren and um, yeah so they're, they're a big part of um, my life too and I'd just like to thank everyone for your attention and taking your time out of um, a Friday to have a listen to me ramble on. Um, I'm sure there's so much more that I could have covered. I am travelling a lot, but during those travels, every day I learn something and um, every day I have barriers that I find my way around because there is um, a lot of stress in uh, the remote communities and um, we're behind uh, a lot. So I might go to a community and talk about the continuous glucose monitoring and I haven't seen it before still and it's been around for years. And so, yeah, that's I think that's me. I don't think there's anything else. Oh, they're just my five communities. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. That was good. It was uh, nice to listen from you um, and uh, hear your story and uh, knowing the, diff the different communities you're seeing. And it uh, was really good. I enjoyed it. Um, we'd like to open up the floor to questions now uh, and uh, see if anyone has any questions I'd like to ask you. Um, we've got one in the chat already from Jenna saying, hi, Cheryl. What are some of your other key pointers for being culturally sensitive when working with Aboriginal people? Good question. Oh, yeah, it's a good question, um, 
thank you so much for the question. Uh, I guess I have built up some experience over um, time, but uh, it depends on where you're going. I guess you <clears throat> you have to be a good listener and try and build rapport over time. <clears throat> up here, I did go to a really good presentation that talked about um, the way that you can try and um, this is just having individual consults, but uh, the Fs are uh, one of the things that I talk about here's um, going through the Fs, so fishing, family, food, uh, football. <laughs> so those are the main ones. But then I, I sort of also have my own things that I go through the Ss. <clears throat> this might be a little bit more clinical, so how are you? You know, you're getting a good sleep. Um, what's what's your stress levels like? Um, you know, are you smoking? Um, yeah, so you sort of can go through those things. And I think if that is being more culturally sensitive, it's just more, like I said, with cultural safety. And it's, it's letting the person sort of lead um, a bit too. Uh, when I first went out to Manning Greta, I went over to the Arts Centre, so networking is really important too. So you sort of, you know, in slowly introducing yourself and I, I sort of went, oh, well, I'm the new diabetes educator here and you get some dirty sort of maybe some looks at this new person and um, it, has anyone here got a story about diabetes they want to talk about? And they said, well, no, you tell the story. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm not here to boss around and tell people how it is. I'm here just to, so it is um, more about being a good listener and just um, building rapport. And it can take six months or even longer. Um, so being more culturally sensitive is please also stop calling people non-compliant. It's really hard though. I know it's sort of built into um, think think beyond about why um, this person hasn't been taking their medications and um, just ask about those um, S's or F's and um, you, you'll develop your own way about um, without being too intrusive um, on a person's life. Um, there's also the really good Stay Strong program. I don't know if anyone's heard about that one. So what, what sort of strengths do you have on that tree? So the Stay Strong program has a tree and then what sort of things will take your strength away and then setting some goals um, of what's achievable for um, them to, to get some more strength. Um, I hope that helped um, a little bit with that question. And good tips there, I think. Uh, anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Yep, Jared. Yeah, hi. Um, my name's uh, Gerard Lockyer. I'm in Perth here, WA. Um, I work for a place called Moody Jenner, where we're a podiatry, diabetes, and nutrition mobile clinic that travel around Perth. Um, we've got about 37, 38 different clinics we go to. Um, so the question is, um, how did the podiatry truck work that you worked on? Yeah, so the, the podiatry truck was set up a while ago by um, a podiatrist called Brian Ralph, or Ralph Brian. He's got, it's interesting when you've got a person with two, um, two first names. Um, and he was very passionate about setting up, I think it was an old Coca-Cola truck, hence it did break down a few times. But there was um, a little desk set up in there and we would put in um, our laptop and a cupboard with all of his equipment and I'd just bring my equipment in and a proper um, chair and all, all equipment with some posters and education. There was air conditioning in there and he would set up a, an annex out front uh, which just pulled out and he had his little chair and table setting and um, some floor matting. And, uh, yeah, just pull out the front of some clinics to get some electricity or an art centre and just run a line or just find some random electricity and uh, just invite uh, people to come in. We generally have a list and, or we would have the laptop that would be um, connected to the patient information record system. So it was, um, or if we were just going to the clinic, then that was a spare clinic room 
um, because clinic rooms can be a real struggle. Um, so he would just pull up out the front there and that was good advertising too. Uh, so people knew that the truck was in town and the truck also would drive around the community and beat the horn and <laughs> uh, say that we're here. So collaboration was a key too in regards to uh, addressing diabetes also. Um, does that help? Um, yeah, no, thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of extra questions in the chat. Uh, Shirin Richards uh, asked, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the intergenerational diabetes and your strategies that you've used or that you've come up with over the years on how you used to, how you teach them and teach about it? Also, just, just in general with inter, um, intergenerational diabetes is because it is a, a relatively new thing in the space of education um, and that sort of stuff because like I said with a five-year-old uh, I guess you, you're just talking about the risks from uh, diabetes and um, because I'm not I haven't been working so much with pregnant ladies but I, I am now um, a lot in all the communities I go to so it is part of the education that the reason why we are humbugging you a bit um, is that we um, have this short period of time that uh, your baby is uh, exposed to uh, an environment that what if you're uh, eating uh, or your sugar levels go up, then uh, the baby also has an exposure to high sugar levels and that means their pancreas their little pancreas will be working um, too hard and then they can um, the baby can grow too big, all that sort of risk. And then probably the it's one of the dot points that you have down the bottom is that um, the baby can grow up to have diabetes in the future too. So I guess that's in pregnancy that I talk about it, but it's um, I have been working with young people who are developing diabetes early in Central Australia. And there's been lots of uh, stuff written um, on the Menzies uh, website where they've got young people being interviewed and telling stories about uh, their, their story about trying to um, deal with diabetes uh, to encourage young people to be able to cope with it. It's a very difficult area dealing with um, diabetes uh, with young people because most of everything out there is for adults, uh, especially with the, uh, type 2 diabetes. So there's there's quite a few resources that I use. So Diabetes Queensland have got some great resources on gestational diabetes uh, and diabetes and pregnancy. And uh, again, Menzies have just released some videos too which I can try and send um, to Eric or Reese later to um, uh, let you guys know what's on there. So, look, it is it is a difficult area because um, pregnancy can be um, a very stressful um, time already. Then you sort of bring diabetes into the mix of it and you want to just try and stay as calm as possible and um, supportive as, as possible. So I hope that um, helped uh, a little bit. There are some resources, but um, it's just, yeah, trying to generally talk and then look for if they do need um, uh, support services in your community, whatever support services there might be. So in Central Australia, there's a look up, an Aboriginal um, unit part of Congress. Um, up here in the remote communities, it's really the clinic and the midwives are just uh, fantastic. And uh, again, any Aboriginal community workers linking in with. Um, going based off that as well, I had a question in relation to what type of stigma uh, with diabetes do you find or do you um, experience with the community in relation to the intergenerational diabetes? Um, not quite sure. 
Uh, I think just in general, there is just that general stigma of they don't care or um, non-compliant, non-adherent without um, you know, needing to do more cultural um, awareness training or getting to know, again, the community that you are in and also in general knowing some uh, background uh, about, for example, with my mum being institutionalised, uh, they were provided with cans of jam, tea and sugar and it's, um, yeah, not the best diet uh, and that's only, like, that's only one generation away for me. Um, also having access to healthy food and um, affordability in some of these remote communities. It's just, yeah, the, the food isn't isn't fresh, it's expensive. Um, and then um, overcrowding at home. So just having that knowledge about what, what's happening, if any, I don't know if anyone knows here, but I've had a house so full of people that I didn't know what to cook. <laughs> and just cooking that much food for a, a large amount of people and then just overnight your fridge is just gone or any time your fridge can be just completely gone. So there's a lot of sorry business that happens. A lot of people travel for sorry business and they will turn up, you know, and I don't like to say they. Um, people could turn up and families could turn up to other families and that's it, the, the food's gone. So why would you go and fill your fridge up again? Uh, it just Just go to the shop. And then the shop's pretty much full of that beautiful, smelling, lovely, salty food, but it's just not healthy. Uh, so there's a few things to consider. Um, intergenerational way, maybe there's also a little bit of just, a, oh, well, that's just the way it is. Uh, and accepting that uh, sugar of 25 is, oh, oh well, okay, that, that's just the way it is. So there's a little bit of um, numbness to it too, I think. Um, and I don't know, Reese, did you, did you mean within the family or do you mean with workers? Health oh, just in general. Though, like, there's a, that, I know there's a lot of stigma out there. One of the main ones I'm looking into at the moment is in relation to um, the, the two, two parts of it, one of it being the shame about having diabetes and yes. the second been about um oh they're aboriginal they're going to get diabetes uh so they're the two stigmas i was interested in because that's what i'm, yeah. I'm branching off and um, sort of researching and trying to work around and whatnot i was just curious as to see what type of ones you uh saw yeah. and that you work with and uh what people have seen um we can talk about that later we've got other questions but i would just try yeah. to answer a few of them uh before the time ends uh, one of them or two of them about uh, types of pictorial diabetes resources. Uh, where do you what are your favorite ones and where would you find some good ones? Oh, uh, look, the, the good old one that I just go to would be um, the good food for people with diabetes, even though there's no such thing as um, a, a diabetic diet, it's just a healthy diet, but it's a great book. Um, I think it was it's developed by um, Healthy Living NT. Uh, so it just goes through uh, what diabetes is and why I've got diabetes. And then the second page will have his it's straight to the point, like here's the risk, the four main risks to uh, your kidneys, number one. And then I might just, yeah, and then if you can talk through that, um, the what your kidneys do, um, and the heart and the feet and the eyes and then it goes straight to the next page it's like you can do something about this so I really like the progression of the way that you can do something about this and it lists the things that uh, you can do and then it'll go through some uh, food ideas and um, I use other resources like I do like some resources from Apuna Pima with um, their sugary drinks and um, posters uh, and uh, some of the videos uh, about um, drinking um, the sugary drinks and choose, choose water. 
Uh, I always usually use the HbA1c um, graph, which can, and then I also have an image of a red blood cell and glucose. And um, if you use that together, it makes more sense about your red blood cell and how it lasts for three months and how we can test um, how your sugar levels have been going over three months. Um, also for pregnancy um, is a very similar book, um, but there are quite a lot more um, resources that I've found for pregnancy. What was that? Uh, was the name of that book? That you Good food. That? Good food for people with diabetes. Cool. Um, that sort of brings us straight into the next question, which is fairly associated. Someone's asked, uh, "What the best diet to follow for people, for Indigenous people having diabetes?" Yeah. So, look, it's a very deep question, but uh, in general, it's just a healthy diet. Um. Uh, the Australian Dietary Guidelines. As a credential diabetes educator, I can't really step too far out of those sort of practices, but then also showing images of the amount of sugar in some food and then trying to encourage people to reduce their sugar, in, sugar intake. And that might just be um, the, the cool drink and working about how to swap it. Don't stop it, swap it. And um, so, yeah, the images of sugar, adding sugar to your tea, looking at um, maybe some alternatives. Um, a healthy diet is really encouraging people to look at their bush foods. So where I'm up here, there's mud crab, barramundi, turtle, long balms, um, mussels, oysters, and you just see people's faces light up when you start talking about what's in season and the type of bush foods and how healthy it is um, to choose choose those types of food. Not always easy um, because sometimes you need a car to go hunting, um, but um, go fishing and, you know, people trying to encourage that type of healthy food is go back 60,000 years and say, well, what sort of foods do you think um, Aboriginal people were um, eating here? And can you still access it and encouraging that too? Uh, just so time conscious here, I think we might have time for one more question. Um, the, we've got it from Helen. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll send them over to Cheryl and she can, uh, she, she will be, uh, we'll, uh, she'll be able to answer them, send it back to us and we can give it to you guys later. Yeah. Um, but the question from Helen is, do you have any tips on hypofears for people on insulin? Thanks, Helen. That's a really good question. Um, fears of hypo is a really difficult one too because if someone's had a hypo, it's the worst. It can be the worst horrible feeling in the world and it can last for hours and hours afterwards. Um, just being really mindful about hypo, so I'm really big on hypos too. We're starting people on the weekly injections and they might still be on glycoside, so I'd say be careful about what other medications they're on. Uh, try and get people to glucose monitor if they can get access to the Libre continuous glucose monitoring. Um, just if looking out for their symptoms, getting their family to um, make sure they support them. Uh, and look out for signs and symptoms like, are you hangry or, you know, maybe we need to check your sugar, making sure that people aren't, uh, people go fishing for the barramundi and they might get stuck there for ages trying to get that elusive barramundi and forget to eat. So just make sure that they are also mindful about if they've got medications on that could last a long time and carry snacks around. Um, with them so looking at strategies really um, about making sure that they're not going without food for a while and having family to support and look out for signs and symptoms and review the medications look look at the medications thank you very much Cheryl uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Eric now um, just, it's been uh, I've been very blessed to listen to you talk um, I think everyone's uh, had a good time and been able to get, uh, gather a lot from you. So thank you very much. Yeah, I've just got one more question, and and that's because there's um you know people who leave their cameras on, they get picked on by me. I'm just looking at all the beautiful people up on TI Henry and the crew, um the young and the young at heart. So I'm one of those young at heart, and some of the crews here uh, is young and 
looking to get in a career in health. So we might be in there now, but we might not be diabetes educators. Um, have you got any advice for young at heart like me, young like Henry? You can jump in any time, Henry, for misrepresenting, but why would we want to become a diabetes educator? What's, what's so good about the job? Oh, so is this a question to me? Question to yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Oh, look, I, I'm always encouraging people to do um, diabetes education because, first of all, there's um, a big job out there and I need some help. Um, and also it's an opportunity maybe to travel, to become expert in your field and also as an average you know, if we can get Aboriginal, more Aboriginal people in as a diabetes educator, we can overcome some of those biases, overcome some of those um, stigma. Uh, and, yeah, Reese, you're right. If I ask a person um, if they've got diabetes, most a lot, a lot of times people are saying, no, I don't. I, no, I don't, when um, people do. So there, there is um, definitely the stigma out there. So overcoming some of those problems, um, the, the potential to um, improve diabetes um, for and the diabetes journey for people and prevention and health promotion um, when you employ an Aboriginal person, I think would be um, really good. But um, anyone who is interested in... Um, becoming a diabetes educator and um, I just would support them 100% to go into this area. I've I've got to meet so many amazing people, go to so many amazing um, communities and um, I thought I was going to retire in this, um, just this diabetes area, but it is, it is a, a really big area complex and, you know, um, People need more information and knowledge because knowledge is power. You give people some power, give them some knowledge, explain the medications. It's more understanding then um, people are going to be more likely to um, and take medications or change their life because I tell people diabetes is very sneaky. It's very silent, very quiet. And um, one of the things I say is, I forgot to say this, is diabetes your friend or your enemy? And a lot of people say, it's my enemy. And I'm like, well, let's work out how we can make diabetes your friend. So you can walk together and so you can be in control. Um, this diabetes might be your friend, but they can sit over there. And if you drive in a car with your friend diabetes, they can sit next to you while you're driving. They can sit in the back seat because you can still see them in the revision mirror, but don't put them in the boot. Because, you know, if you put diabetes out of your mind, they'll do some trouble in your boot, mess around with your, your tail lights. Um, and if you make diabetes your enemy, they'll just rubbish you and talk behind your back <laughs> and just make trouble for you. So, and then you'll worry and stress about it. So I'm like diabetes your friend. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> um, thanks, Cheryl. Very inspiring for me personally because I'm heading down, hopefully, the path that you tread. Um, I got you. I got you. For all those other people that are on that path, thanks for being there. And um, have you got some from Cheryl? I always do. The photos just really epitomise, okay, I'm in the right place. And for those of you, particularly in the Torres Strait, um, in Outback, New South Wales, Jared in West Australia, you know, working in remote areas. Um, who else? Catherine and I know. They're Jen on all so, um, The photos really really epitomise the work that we're doing, that it's working with people. Now, I'm just going to share a screen just to um, give you a couple of email addresses, mainly myself and also Diabetes New South Wales. And also, you'll notice in the um, chat, I've put in the links for um, the evaluation. There's also the, um, what do you call it, the QR code for the evaluation. But while that's on screen, I'll just ask... Um, just to talk a little bit about what we've got planned for the next six months, because um, one of the things that you know we love hearing about is people that um, are Indigenous diabetes educators doing the work in the field. Um, just tell us what's happening out there. So if I sh I'll share the screen, and Reese, if you would just update on what we've got planned for the next six months. Yep. 
Um, so over the next uh, couple of forums, we've got uh, two more Indigenous CDEs who are keen to share their story um, and uh, um, advise everyone about their tips and hints for, um, regarding uh, educating people with diabetes who are Indigenous or who are in the community. Um, and then for the for the last forum um, before the end of the financial year, we're going to bring every one of the every one of the speakers back, Cheryl and the other two who will be coming up shortly, um, as a panel to discuss things a bit more uh, further and have a bit of a Q and A type discussion. Uh, you guys come in through with the questions, ask what questions you have in mind, and uh, we will have the presenters. Uh, Tell us their thoughts and their views and perspectives on um, that particular question. Um, and that's what we've got planned over the next couple of months in regards to the forums. Um, feel free to also put in the evaluation forms what you guys would like to see in the next couple of forums because um, we might be able to sort of uh, help uh, facilitate that in the next coming as well. Hopefully on screen now you can see um, the QR code in the chat box. You can see the evaluation link. Um, you can also see the Diabetes Queensland First Nations Unit uh, generic email address. Um, we're being really well supported by Diabetes Australia at the moment. We're in this process of uh, coming together under the one banner. Um, so particularly in the relation to those... Um, request about resources, pictorial resources. Diabetes Australia has just um Diabetes Australia has just um oh, what do you call it? Um approved a number of different pictorial guides that we'd be happy to share with it around the country, even though they're out of Queensland, but um we've got some to share just to get your views on um if they do good in your work. So on that note, I'll just um, wrap it up on time, two minutes past 12, and it's good to see your faces for those who we see regularly. Um, the TI mob, I will see you in about two weeks. I'll drop in. Um, the rest of you, I hope to see your faces soon. Mm -hmm.